Do you want to know how good Great Sword in Rise is? <laughs> it's very good. Oh yes, my fellow hunters, my fellow wielders of oversized swords, my fellow smacker of monsters for ludicrous numbers. It's time to talk the best weapon in all of Monster Hunter and how it fares in Rise. Spoiler alert, it's pretty good. So join me then as we talk moveset, we talk silk binds, we talk switch skills, we talk numbers, we talk armor skills that are good now, armor skills that are bad now. We talk every little nitty gritty detail, making this the place to be if you have even the slightest inclination of playing this glorious weapon. Generally, whether this weapon is where it's at. And again, spoiler alert, it is where it's at. Beginning then with the moveset, it Great is... Sword. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go somewhere else now. As I was saying, beginning with the basic moveset, it is essentially unchanged. So if you liked it in World and Icebond, you're gonna enjoy it here. You have your three levels of charge across three charged moves, resulting in that ever so satisfying true charge a strike now you also got your shoulders of course to plow through monster attacks take less damage and generally make hitting that true charge strike that much easier utility defined but don't worry if you're at the end of your rope <laughs> with this way of playing ah uh, my knees. There is better and brighter in Rise. Now, of course, the shoulder still used for, you know, plowing through attacks, as I said. And uh, we have our round slash as well, which is even better for element and status this time around. If you wanna, if you wanna use an element or a status <laughs> uh, There's also the two moves that you will literally never use, except if you're maybe fighting small monsters, the general circle slice and the uh, upwards little dink that is you know kind of the default except for one modification brought in rise which is to say after a aerial attack which of course can charge as usual well when we land we can do the super swipe which again like usual but now it will take us fully into the true charge as a follow-up so just a little bit of a speed up and well in the air instead of the usual aerial attack you can instead do a down Downward kind of sort of Damocles drop stab for multiple hits of damage, chargeable too, so it's another option. Both are fine, but chiefly you're always going to be using the normal default chop, it's the much heftier amount of damage and much easier to hit. So, let's enough of that, let's talk the Rise goodness. So firstly, our two default silk bind attacks. The first one, Power Sheath! I cannot express to you how incredibly good this move is. It is burst movement either out of danger or to reposition towards a monster to keep destroying it that sheaths your weapon, which we want to do anyway on a great sword on a reposition, and with that sheath gains a boost of plus 23 raw, which is an appreciable increase. Now, I would describe that as level 7 attack just for free, essentially, if attack hadn't changed completely in Rise, which we will get to. But needless to say, it's very good. You are going to want to keep this buff up for as long as you can during the hunt, and essentially you can keep it up permanently. You will be using a power sheaf constantly through the hunt in every which way. It is an absolutely potent utility movement tool on a weapon that absolutely cries out for potent movement utility tools. 
I am in love with Power Sheath. It also, because why not, comes with iframes at the very beginning. There is very few of them, the timing is very, very narrow, but still, it is there. You can use it after a shoulder tackle, after an attack is finished, after a roll, and basically, it replaces the traditional finish fully charged hit on monster, roll away sheath, and turns it into finish fully charged attack on monster, power sheath away, or power sheath to reposition, or power sheath to now flinched monster, you've just wyvern rided a monster to the ground, well, get your sod out in the air, land power sheath over to the flailing monster's head, and start going to town. It is bristling with possibilities, and you can use it to be wherever you need to be, whether that's different part of the monster or closer to it, or as a sudden emergency exit if you're caught in the open with your weapon out, and you don't have any other options. It is... Brilliant. The other silk bind, however, is an absolute garbage fire. Now look, don't get me wrong, for style points, it's badass. Firebug up, lead the air, spin, slap down on the monster, spring back up, off it, classic aerial greatsword style, and then come crashing back down with either of the two aerial greatsword options. Yeah, that's a lot of fun, but it costs two wire bugs. It's finicky to hit. The damage that it does isn't that impressive when you consider that you can do more aerial damage via just sheathing, wire bugging into the air, and air attacking as normal. And because that costs one wire bug per attack compared to two for Hunting Edge, it is just more DPS. Now, Hunting Edge after the monster moves, after you finish the combo to chase it down while also keep attacking, yeah, that's doable, but the thing is you have power sheath for that to still chase it and arrive in a position to start beats, but also with a damage up. And when we compare to what you can switch skill this Silkbind to, it really is hard to justify using Hunting Edge unless you are going for a very niche anti-flying monster aerial damage boost whole, like, wyvern riding weird kind of build, which, let's be honest, I'll probably do, because I love that kind of stuff. But for general play in a general build doing general great sordery, it's just not, well, cutting it. <laughs> Let's then switch over to switch skills as we switch the switch switch skills on the greatsword for a switch up to our playstyle. First and foremost, we can alter the tackle. I know, why would we want to change a move that lets us on demand be immune to knockbacks, take huge amounts of reduced damage and continue our combo in order to smack the monster real hard? Well, the new one can still do all of those three things, but, well, kinda less well. So how exactly does Guard Tackle work? Well, the chief difference is that it swaps it from a rock steady, can't be knocked over, take less damage effect to a quite literal guard effect, therefore using all of guard mechanics. So yes, it will block attacks that hit you during this tackle. And by block, I mean, yes, it will use your sharpness like a normal greatsword block. That's essentially how you have to look at this. Imagine the normal hold block in front of you option the greatsword has, but you're moving forward during it and continuing your combo. This means that firstly, instead of tackle, which is effective at full 360 degrees around you, so even if you get hit in the back, you're still good, this only applies 180 degrees in front of you. So that's not great too. They both cost the same stamina, and they both travel you forward the same distance. Now the guard tackle will do a bit more damage with its little ending slap than the actual tackle will do, and it will also generally reduce the damage that you take more than a normal tackle because it's blocking, so you just take the chip damage. Of course, you are exchanging that reduced damage for an eat to your sharpness, and I really can't stress this enough. Using this switch skill means that every time you tackle and tank an attack, you will eat your sharpness, and this categorically, absolutely, unequivocally,
unequivocally sucks. You do not want to be having to sharpen this often because every time you tackle, well, there it goes. And the guard tackle then is also slower and lasts longer. You see, with a normal tackle you get, well, look, here's the comparison between the two. With the normal tackle, you are committed to it for a second. That's the window of, well, don't get knocked over, take less damage. And it's also how long you're committed to the tackle before you can then go into an attack. Normally, the final in your combo. Whereas with the guard tackle, it's 1.6 seconds. And you might be like, well, does that matter too much? It's just a little bit longer of can't be hit by stuff. Well, the thing is, it does. Because you don't need that extra 0.6 seconds to absorb the attack that you pressed it for in the first place. In fact, all that extra 0.6 seconds does is give the monster an extra 0.6 seconds to wind up the next attack, forcing you to either have to tackle again or get hit. You want a short and sweet, well-timed tackle. Okay, attack absorbed. Okay, go. Boom. You don't want to be spending so long slowly guarding forward before you're allowed to actually follow up with you know, something. Essentially, if I had to describe Guard Tackle, it just feels like a slower, worse, less fun, clunkier version of Normal Tackle. There's only two main benefits to it as far as I can see. One, for players newer to the weapon that don't have as much experience with the monster's movesets, that extra 0.6 seconds allows for an extra 0.6 seconds of error margin when it comes to timing a tackle through an attack. And number two, yes, it's a guard, so guard skills work. Yes, you could use the ramp up skill, which prevents the sharpness loss, but that means using a pretty bad selection of weapons. Yes, you can use offensive guard, but even plus 15% damage on a perfectly timed guard is not worth using something this clunky when you consider that to get level 3 offensive guard you have to cripple your set given how hard it is to come by at the moment. It's entirely possible in the future when we can comfortably have it on top of all the other skills that we want this might end up being the way to go but for now basically not. Now there is a little bit of a bonus feature when it comes to guard tackle and that is if you do block something you can skip straight into true charge or rage slash. Which sounds great, but it's also pointless, because the general Great Sword loop, and this counts as just global advice for how to best play this weapon, is run up to monster, draw attack it, go into either the strong charge or a tackle, then finish with your true charge or rage slash, then roll or power sheaf away, reposition, and go again. This is the core. Now, you'll notice in that sequence, it doesn't matter if that middle tackle blocked an attack and therefore lets you skip to true charge, because true charge is next anyway. The only real situation at which this could be useful is if the monster has fallen over after your true charge, so you roll towards it, tackle, and then go into true charge again, except, oh wait, the monster's not going to hit you because it's down, so you don't get to do the skip for blocking anyway. The only way to consistently use this feature of guard tackle is to draw into block, kick, guard tackle, go into true charge. It's just kind of neat, you can play a style of wait for the monsters about to attack you and pull this combo off. But Offensive Guard would trigger on the uh, draw into block anyway, so you're only really gaining the skip into two charge, which really doesn't save that much time, and the damage isn't great either because you're not getting that initial draw attack damage. So it's not really a huge benefit. In any case, there is potential in the future for an Offensive Guard set that uses this, but until that's a comfortable reality, this is simply, in my humble opinion, worse tackle. But then we get to our next switch kill, and we'll talk about the Silkbind one first. So we get to swap our, you know, awful hunting edge for the most part, to Adamant Charged Slash. Now this only costs one wire bug, which is already really quite amazing, and what it essentially is is Power Sheaf again, a immediate dash in a direction, and then thing happens. Except the thing that happens this time is for the whole duration of it, you are in a essentially rock steady state, the monster can damage you but not knock you away, 
And when you arrive at the end of the pull, you go into strong charge. You know, the middle fairly hefty hit of your combo, which you can then charge and hit or release straight away. During the entire charge, you're still rock steadied, and then you can follow up with your rage or your true charge. It is glorious. Now, if your power sheaf buff is not up, then power sheaf is priority when it comes to using one of these. But once your power sheaf is up, if you knock the monster away, adamanting over to it, slapping it with that level two, and then going into your true charge is just magnificent. Now, don't get me wrong, you're not going to be using it an absolute ton, but it is incredibly useful. You can power through rolls with it, you can open a fight with it. In fact, a really good opener is to uh, trigger the monster, I've seen you, then you can adamant towards it, tank the raw, and then go into Rage Slash, which we'll talk about later, for its follow-up hit to then return an even bigger one. Now, do be aware that, again, during Rage Slash, which we'll talk about later, and during Adamant, you still can be stunned, but everything else, you will just tank through. Well, grabs can also, well, grab you. And while we're in Tip City here, I suppose it should be mentioned that if you do get a Wyvern Ride opportunity, trigger the Wyvern Ride with your most powerful charge attack possible. Draw slash Adamant Charge, aim at a part of a monster that will kind of wall you, otherwise it will pull you through the monster like Power Sheaf will, so there's a little bit of a finicky art to, you know, going for the main bulk of the monster so that it prevents you from going to an undesirable spot where you will miss, but this also makes a very useful tool for for getting Wyvern Rides as Greatsword, because the damage is equal to a normal strong charge, which is really good, but it counts as the special damage for Wyvern Riding. So generally, it's just a magnificent utility tool, and everything that I said that was positive about Power Sheaf applies here. It is burst movement, but in a different option that makes you almost get a guaranteed safer death hit off that then puts you into the next and final and most powerful stage of your combo. If you have both Power Sheaf and this, both one wire bug cost, you will be zipping around the place, running circles around the monster, exchanging rock steady charges for sheaths and damages up, interweaving them, and just being an absolute great sorting nuisance, and it feels fantastic. And you see what I mean, that when you compare the ability to dash into your middle of your combo while rock steadied, to leap into the air and do a tiddly bit of damage that you could do anyway from a normal aerial attack, it's really hard to justify using anything other than this. So, following that then, we have the big one. The change to true charge itself. Yes, you don't have to play with it. In fact, you can play with Rage Slash. Yeah, they, they uh, named, a, named a great sword attack after me. I'm sure that's what happened. Uh, I'd like to thank my family and my friends for supporting me all the way to this point, and I will humbly do this move proud. Thank you, Capcom! Thank you! But in all seriousness, this thing is amazing! For any of you that have played Generations Ultimate, remember Brimstone Slash? Well, it is a miniature version of that. First and foremost, then, you don't need to do the initial tiddly little hit that powers up your true charge. It's just a full level 3 charge and slap. During that level 3 charge, you are rock steadied. You're not damage reductioned, but you are immune to being knocked away. So already, this is fairly awesome, because basically this hit is going to go off, save for the monster, you know, killing you. But it kind of is pointless if the hit is so pathetically tiny compared to true charge. Well, it is and it isn't. At normal strength, and we'll get to why I'm saying normal strength in a moment, but at normal strength, a fully charged level 3 Rage Slash will do about 60% of the damage of a true charge which is a fairly big drop, 40% weaker, but the advantage is they're easier to hit, more consistent to hit, because you can't get knocked out of them. So that starts to seem like, okay, I get it, it's a trade-off, you know, consistency for less damage. However, 
If you get hit while charging the Rage Slash, like with Old Brimstone, then it powers up the attack. But how much does it power up? How much do you need to get hit for? Well, this is the big question. So against the training dummy in my test set, a true charge hits for 1024 damage, which is, you know, not bad. For comparison, the Rage Slash is 629, so a good 400 gap. But then, uh, let's get to testing. If we take one large barrel bomb's worth of damage while we charge, goes up to 873, which is plus 30%-ish. Which is a nice bump, especially when you consider that one barrel bomb's worth of damage is really quite a tiny amount of damage. Which is why the fact that you essentially need to get hit to fuel this playstyle isn't really a downside, as long as you're not completely recklessly going in against the monster's most powerful attacks and you're playing relatively normally, essentially it just means that you can get so many more hits off and so many times a monster knocks you out of true charge anyway. Obviously we try our best not to have that happen and if you could land true charges back to back to back perfectly without ever getting hit because you're a god, then obviously true charge is the better playstyle. But I will tell you this right now to skip ahead for a little bit, Rage Slash is the most fun playstyle. The fact that you can just do it, take any given little nick, bite, stab, explosion the monster takes you, take about 30% of your health and damage, and then return with I mean, I mean, look, the intro of this video! <laughs> Tell me you don't want that to be your hunting experience all the time! Alright, so, one barrel bomb worth 830, about a 30% increase from base Rage Slash. If we take it to two large barrel bombs worth of damage, which is still, look, not that much damage, then you go to a 934 hit, also known as essentially plus 50% damage from the base Rage Slash, which is what it was with Brimstone Slash back in day. So this is your cap. Three bombs, still 934. Four bombs, still 934. So you really don't have to take a lot of damage to hit things very hard with this move. So at 934, compared to the 1034 of the true charge, a fully powered Rage Slash is about 90% of the damage of a true charge, which is a very small gap, all things considered. And again, if you can perfectly back to back to back to back land true charges without ever being cancelled or hit or whatever, then yes, it's better. But I would argue in every other situation, especially with how fast, agile, and consistently hitting the monsters are in this game, Rage Slash is the way to go. There is also the fact that Rage Slash can hit in 360 degrees. No matter where the monster is, you can spin around and smack it, whereas True Charge, you are very limited to a sort of 40 degree cone in front of you, which is really nice utility. Now, the one disadvantage to Rage Slash, outside of the fact that, you know, you take damage to do it, but look, I, again, I really want to stress, every single time that you are true charging and you get hit, that would have been better as a Rage Slash, because you're taking the damage anyway, but now you're returning a load of damage. And look, the damage from the completely unpowered up one that's 40% weaker than True Charge is still a lot of damage because it's Greatsword. And it comes out faster because you get to the hit faster, because you don't have to do the extra little bit first. So you can hit more often with Rage Slash anyway, even if you're not tanking damage. Though talking of tanking damage, it should be said there is a damage reduction component to both Adamant Slash and Rage Slash. Having taken a, a large barrel bomb both during Rage Slash and without with the same defense value, and then counting pixels of red to compare the reduction, well, it's 30%, and 30% is a hefty amount and makes this entire thing even better. It would be good enough without it, but with this, it's actually kind of ridiculous. You can even make the argument it's worth running heroics because you can comfortably survive a hit on 35% health and then return with ludicrous damage. 
In any case... The other main disadvantage is that when the monster is down or in a position where it can't hit you, well, you have to hit for the minimal amount of damage because there's nothing going on that will power you up. So there is that. On a downed monster situation, true charge is the way to go. I would also argue that in multiplayer hunts, true charge is also the way to go because the monster will be focused on other people a lot of the time, giving you many more easier windows to land the more guaranteed higher damage. But in a solo hunt where it's mano a mano against the monsters in this game that are very, very good at hitting you very often and quickly, Rage Slash is such a consistent way to make it happen. I uh, managed to go from about an average of when I was farming up on Rathalos an 18 minute kill time, which is really achingly, crawlingly slow, to sub 10 minutes just by swapping to Rage Slash, tanking attacks and smacking him as hard as I could. And that is a really, really big increase. So unless you're approaching speedrunner level of good with this weapon, you're just simply going to get more out of Rage Slash because you will hit the monster way more than you will with True Charge, which adds up ultimately to way more damage. And again, it's so much fun! I cannot stress that enough. It feels... Good! So, now we're gonna talk about skills, and really, understanding how Rage Slash works is a very big important factor when it comes to what skills are good for Great Sword in Rise. Now, before we get on to this section, if I don't mention a skill, if you find yourself going, but what about X? Well, it's because it's exactly as good or bad for Greatsword as it was in World and Iceborne. It's not changed. So, for example, Weakness Exploit, I'm not going to say anything about because plus 50% affinity on weak bats is still really, really good. It's not especially extra good in Rise. It's not worse than it was in Rise. It's just still very good and desirable. Now, another skill that I wouldn't have mentioned here is attack normally, but let's cover this. It's changed hugely in Rise. Instead of just a plus 21 raw, which, you know, wasn't the worst thing in the world, but definitely got outshined by pure affinity crit boost builds, now it gives plus 10 raw, which is obviously less, but plus 10% attack, making it the most desirable skill for the weapon and probably a lot of weapons, simply because affinity is so hard to build for in Rise, chiefly because there is no weakness exploit decoration, so you're very limited in terms of what armor pieces you can use to try and reach that sweet, sweet 100% crit. Handicraft is briefly worth mentioning as worse than it used to be for two main reasons. One, getting enough of it to meaningfully make a weapon white that used to be blue and therefore the best greatsword completely cripples the rest of your build and therefore makes it actually not as good as staying blue and just going for more offensive skills. So yeah, also with the second reason being that sharpening has never been easier because all of the big skills are two slots. Well, our one slots are basically free to do what we like with, which means getting Speed Sharpener is not just, like, easy, it's honestly desirable and recommended for anything that needs to sharpen. And because you can safely sharpen on your dog, really sharpness issues are kind of gone. So, there are two big winners in terms of skills and two big losers in terms of skills. The two losers are Maximum Might, and it lost the same way that it lost in Iceborne. It needs you to be at full stamina for a little bit. And the TLDR here is if you have used any stamina before a Rage Slash or True Charge, Maximum Might won't be up for it. And what do you mostly do before those things? Tackle, and tackle costs stamina. Crit Draw is the other one, and this is just, I mean... Look how they mask with my boy. 40% over 100! Are you kidding me? And the thing is, Crit Draw has a lot of potential in Rise, and we will still be using this skill for a Crit Draw build, because, you know, 40% is still good amount of affinity in Rise, but 40%! Oh! And you may notice now that it says it lasts for a little bit after the draw attack, and it does. How long? Don't get excited, it's two seconds, which means it's impossible to get to a rage or true charge under this effect, so sadness. However, on the happiness front, the two winners are firstly, Resentment. 
So this is max rank plus 25 raw while you have red health. Now normally this is a bit kind of gimmicky to say the least, but what will you always have during a rage slash that you have been hit during? Red health. So it has never been more of a reliable source of raw damage for Greatsword as it is now. So I like that a lot. And to really put this into perspective, these two builds here are equivalent in their effective damage output. So yeah, it really is quite worth to considering. But it is also quite hard to get resentment, so yeah, we're still kind of probably leaning towards attack with as much affinity as we can get. But still, potential. Dogging of potential, latent power is the other winner, and I, I, I never thought I would say that. It's kind of a garbage skill, and it always has been. Basically, once the hunt starts, after 300 seconds, 5 minutes, you will get a buff to your affinity and a stamina reduction buff. This will also happen once you've taken 180 damage. Both terrible activation conditions for really quite a potent effect. But what do you do while rage slashing? Take damage. So latent power has never been easier to activate for Greatsword. Now, should you build around it? No, it still takes a while to activate and isn't ideal. However, having latent power on your armor has gone from, I, I guess there's some latent power, okay, nice, to, oh, a bit of bonus latent power, that's actually quite helpful. And that's, you know, nice. Especially when you consider that Zenoga Helm and Chest, which is two out of your three weakness exploit that everyone will be wearing, has two latent power. And for Greatsword, that is going to be more helpful than arguably for anyone else by a fair margin. So that's really good. Finally then, focus. This is as good as it ever was, so technically I shouldn't mention it, but... Yeah, it's really, really nice. It takes 0.3 seconds off of your charges-ish, and, well, it's 15% faster, which is about 0.3 seconds. I, I don't really know what I expected. And while on paper that seems tiny, getting your attack out that much quicker before the monster can hit you is really good. And you might be like, ah, but you want the monster to hit you with Rage Slash. Well, yes, but the window, even with focus, is still massive. And you want to get hit and then do the hit and then get away as quickly as possible. So standing there charging for longer just gets you hit twice, which really isn't good or necessary. So yeah, it is one of the skills that makes the weapon feel so much better and more fun to play and heartily recommended as core. So that's about it for everything of note armor wise. There is some ramp up skills that are worth considering but I will go across them more specifically in my best greatsword build that is uh, coming very soon but generally just attack and affinity is good as always. There's nothing like oh my god this changes everything which is both I guess good and bad at the same time. So when it comes to actually using the weapon how it feels is it good as we reach this point finally after like half an hour. I really hope you guys have enjoyed this. A lot has gone into this video, but I just, I really love my great sword, baby. In terms of playing the weapon, it is pretty much just how it was in World in Icebond. You're going to be more grounded than most of the weapons when it comes to silk binds, but hopping in and engaging with a monster from an air-based position and getting your level 3 air charge is very nice. There is nothing wrong with it whatsoever. Landing into the swipe and then going into your finisher is really good, and when you have added and Edge along with Rage Slash, you essentially can rock steady up to the monster, rock steady hit it with a charge, go into your neck, rock steady Rage Slash, get hit and then rock steady hit it for a huge damage and you just feel like an absolute tank wall that the monster just can't do anything about no matter how hard it tries. It has never been more faster or more fun or more straight up oh, yes bring it to play greatsword than it is in rise the playstyle is essentially just relentless it is don't stop can't stop won't stop for any reason or rhyme i am going to just keep hitting this monster and no matter what he does including you know hitting me back it doesn't matter and that is so 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 good the weapon has never felt better in my opinion there is so many potential play styles there is so much flavor there is so much fun to be had and it is all worth exploring and really getting behind there is nothing here that i really completely don't like except maybe guard tackle 
and Hunting Edge, but even then, they will have their niche builds, and I'm sure they will be at least fun, and maybe perhaps one of them very, very, very good. I hope then uh, this has been helpful, informative in some sort of way. I hope dearly uh, that you uh, pick up the great sword and try uh, your best to use its magnificence, because really, it is magnificence. It is just the weapon for hitting the hardest, highest numbers, and there is always something so mind-bogglingly satisfying about that. Rage Slash is an absolute revelation, but if you don't want to play the tank everything style, you can still play the Iceborne and world that we know or love. The cookie cutter of draw, tackle or hit into Rage True Charge, is still where it's at, with the added utility of zipping around the place with your two silk binds to really maneuver and weave in your combos, keeping up the power sheath buff, and generally, it's just an absolute blast. If you have any specific questions, please ask me down below and I'll try my best to answer them, but for now, look out for my official, actual, what is just mathematically the best greatsword build possible at the moment in Rise, and I will see you soon. Please like you enjoyed this, subscribe for more, and consider supporting the channel on Patreon down below. This was one hell of a project, and you guys are really what keeps us going. A good boy. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos. Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes. Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice. To reiterate that it is nice. To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage. Is, uh, goodbye.